Okay, this lecture is about the visualization. The visualization, and I put that in quotes because I'm not very sure how I feel about all this. The visualization of P forms and N vectors. So the reason I'm putting this in quotes and I'm being a little bit smarmy about it is because visualization is always sort of a stand-in for the word intuition. And intuition is a stand-in for the concept of make it easy, please, comma, please. So to some extent, I, I can respect that. I mean, I got here from the same reason that everybody else did is I really wanted to understand this and I'd rather it be easy than hard, right? So I, I get it. Um, on the other hand, the fact is, is all of this material is fundamentally abstract. That's the basic idea. The, all the work we've done was abstract. In fact, it actually is very related to the concept of abstract algebra right? Algebra we can kind of understand. x squared plus, well, I guess ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. We understand how to solve these things. But when we start talking about group theory and modules, so groups and modules and rings and fields, and I've no particular order, in fact, uh, uh, which I covered in our section on uh, algebraic structures, you realize that you have to think about everything abstractly. And if you don't think about it abstractly, you're, you're, you're never going to be able to make the jump that mathematics requires. And likewise, with tensors, we've shown everything to be maps, right? We've kind of driven this abstract principle, the notion of maps, maps between sets, you know, V to R, the dual of V to R, um, then uh, ultimately the inner product driving a connection between V and V star, right? And then that inner product abstractly and canonically picking out an element of, of the 0 to uh, tensor product space to give us the metric, right? This is all very abstract stuff. And even this concept of manifolds, right, the whole idea of a manifold, right, was totally abstract if you followed those set of lectures, too. The abstraction there is just, is just stunning, and the whole idea of a coordinate system is all abstract. Everything is very abstract. But from time to time, we can, in fact, create visualizations that help us make these little intuitive leaps between one abstract concept and another. Uh, in quantum mechanics, right, if you've ever studied, I presume if you're here, you've probably studied some quantum mechanics. The whole idea of quantum mechanics is based on this notion of the wave function, right? And the wave function is not an intuitive idea. But once you capture the wave function's understanding, its axiomatic meaning, right, through the Born rule, right, the, the magnitude squared of the wave function gets related to a probability. Once you kind of understand that, and then you understand the differential equations that generate this, after a while you do in fact develop sort of an intuitive understanding of how wave functions function. Um, but you go through the abstraction first. You learn this rule, this abstract part first, and then you develop the intuition. And that's sort of where we're at right now. We've developed all of these abstract rules. And from them we've developed all of the old index gymnastics, right? And the funny thing is the index gymnastics was supposed to be a crutch in some sense to get you uh, to um, kind of hide all of the abstract algebra, right? Let, we'll just create these rules called index gymnastics and teach those, and we can kind of hide all this stuff. But in these lessons, what we've done is we've pulled all this stuff to the forefront and explained index gymnastics. So now you can use it, but it's not hiding anything. It's actually... Um, it's actually simplifying stuff that you understand. But we've gone through all of the abstraction. So now I guess we can try our little hand at visualizing things. And I guess that's the purpose of this lecture. So um, the, the sort resources for this lecture, uh, I'm going to, I usually don't cite 
books, but in this case, it makes a lot of sense to do it. The, the most famous book that actually talks about this visualization is Gravitation by Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler. It's a huge book, um, but it goes out of its way to do visualizations of p-forms and vectors. Um, so uh, the, the upside is it's great for the subject. The downside is that it's huge, right? It's a big book. And if you're just starting out, I really don't recommend it. Um, it. It looks very appealing. It looks like it'd be a great book to start studying general relativity from. Um, I don't think it is a great book to start with, for my personal opinion. However, once you have a grasp of the basics of the subject, you can actually go through there and look for the sidebars that deal with visualization and the figures. And from that, you can kind of get it. It especially helps if you've gone through these lectures. These lectures, if you've gone through these lectures, then you can probably tackle this. Um, but the sidebars about visualization and the figures, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes from there. The other place is another book titled Geometrical Vectors by a man named Gabriel. I think it's Gabe. Let's see. Uh, Gabriel, I think, goes R-I-E-L, but his last name is different. It's Weinreich, which goes E-R, or E-I-N-R-E-I-C-H. So you have I-E here and E-I there. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, he's a physics professor from University of Chicago, I think, or at least his book was written by Chicago um, Lectures in Physics. It's small. It's like... It's well below 200 pages. In fact, it might not even be 120 pages long. Um, but this book, Geometrical Vectors, uh, really, really, really tax visualization in an aggressive way. Um, the downside of geometrical vectors is they never mention forms. They never use the word forms. Um, they never use the word p-forms or p-vectors, right? They never talk about the wedge product. Gravitation does, in fact, use the wedge product. So with geometrical vectors, it, you are forced to interpret Mr. Weinreich's language in terms of the language we've used today. But that's what I'm going to do here in this lecture. So if you want two books, those are the two I would definitely recommend. The other um, problem with geometrical vectors is it focuses almost entirely on three dimensions, which is fine. We're going to actually do that. We're going to follow that path. I should say that's a problem. That actually is a great way to start it. He does talk about n dimensions later. Um, in the gravitation, they just speak generally in n dimensions uh, or four dimensions. Four, of course, is the one that matters for general relativity. So this is the foundation of our next few lectures. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get through this, but it's probably worth the exercise. Okay, so let's begin. We start with the concept of an arrow. An arrow is going to be a special kind of vector. Okay? So when I say a special kind of vector, I mean an arrow is an element of a vector product of a, of a vector space, and I'll call that space V, like I always have. And because it's a vector space, we know it has its own defined addition. It's going to be a real vector space, and it's going to be in dimensions 3 right now. Um, so there's a special vector space. Its members are called arrows. And if we looked at this vector product, oh, and it has a basis, uh, and the basis will be E1, E2, and E3. How about that? So we can now, uh, with this notion of basis, we don't have an inner product. There's no inner product, right? So how will I indicate that? I'll put the inner product, and then I'll put a red line through it, just so we know that there's no inner product. It doesn't have to mean there's no inner product, but we don't need one, and so we're not going to presume one. But even without the inner product, we can still go into this vector space, and we can represent arrows using a nice little coordinate axis, where E1, E2, and E3 represent our basis vectors. Now, the reason this is risky is that without an inner product, this notion of perpendicularness 
doesn't make any sense, right? Without an inner product, we can't say that the projection of E1 on E3 is zero or E2, that these, the notion of perpendicularity doesn't mean much. So for, uh, but uh, we can still, we can still, um, uh, we, can, we can still play with this as a way of drawing and visualizing a particular vector, so or a particular arrow. So that arrow comes out like this, and it'll have components on E1, E2, and E3. Now, um, so now let's go ahead and actually give this space an inner product so we can talk about a few things comfortably. So now it does have an inner product, and now we can talk about the magnitude of this arrow. We'll call the arrow A, and we'll, des we'll describe it by an arrow by giving this little vector symbol on top, this symbol you would have seen in physics for um, uh, vectors, right? It kind of looks like that. So that's the arrow. Well, why don't I make it a full-on arrow? So we can talk about the magnitude of A because we have an inner product. We can talk about the perpendicularity of A. Let's say this basis system is orthogonal. How about that? Maybe it'll make it a little easier. And um, so... Uh, the thing about A is that if we rotate the coordinate system and we change the basis vectors, we change these guys to some rotated, just a pure rotation, right? We know that this is not a big deal, right? A is going to remain A, and this figment of our imagination, this coordinate system, is going to change. And the reason I call it a figment of our imagination is because we can choose any basis vectors we want, orthogonal, not orthogonal. It can be oriented this way, or it could be oriented this way, right? Or any other way. It doesn't really matter. The coordinate system really is our whimsical uh, fixation on the vector space. The vector A, that's the thing that doesn't change. So... Rotating is not really a problem. The components of A will definitely change when we rotate. By the way, this is all going to be visualization, so I'm not going to write down things like, you know, A, and then there's some matrix T that uh, transforms A into, you know, A prime, where the components are different. I'm not going to go through any of that. I'm just going to, we're just going to describe it, right? Because our goal is this visualization, intuition thing, so that means what? No math, I guess, right? So we're not going to do any math. So, um, but here's the thing about A that, uh, that Weinreich points out. We often think about rotating the coordinate system. We don't have trouble with that. But one of the deformations of the coordinate system we don't think about all the time in classical physics, in our standard physics, is expanding or contracting the coordinate system. We have no trouble taking a physics problem that might involve, say, a block, and then a pulley, and then maybe another pulley and a rope, and then, I don't know, another pulley, and then another block, I guess. I don't know why you'd have three pulleys in a physics problem, but... You might. And then there's these forces of gravity, right? Um, and uh, we, we look at this thing and we say, well, let's see, we've got a coordinate system. Well, that's not so good. Let's choose this coordinate system. We pick one that's kind of aligned with most of the forces. Um, you know, maybe there's some rope here and another pulley here, right, with another weight. So there's a force. And that force isn't totally aligned, but... I'd rather align my coordinate system like this than like this because at least I capture two of the forces with, and the goal is to make the number of components a minimum. So we rotate the coordinate systems in our head and we don't have any trouble and we do it, we settle on one and then we solve our problem. But what we never think of when we do this process is we don't think really of, well, what if I expand the coordinate system, right? In other words, I would take E1 and turn it into that. I'll use the color green instead of primed or anything. And say I just expanded it, right? If I expand it, you know, what, what I'm doing by rotating here, by choosing this coordinate system instead of this one, right? I guess I should make it a little clearer. This coordinate system, which might have been aligned with that force, choosing this coordinate system, which are aligned with these two forces, which what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, I'm trying to set 
the components of these guys to zero, except for one, so it's nice and easy. This guy's, I'm gonna have to live with two components, or I could use this component, coordinate system. This guy will have one component, and these guys will have two. So two with one is better than, than two with two, so I choose this one. But we don't think, the, this process of expanding or contracting the coordinate system doesn't really enter into our forefront of our thinking. We choose, it, it's basically the same as choosing units, right? I'm choosing feet or meters, and once I've chosen that, I, I don't care. But choosing the, the difference between feet and meters is expanding or contracting E, because, um, you know, if I had feet and I want meters now, I've got to make this, this thing really has to be essentially longer, because if this was set in feet, well, then I change these basis vectors, well, now it's, it's in the wrong place, right? The, the, um, the, the arrow's not short enough, right? Because the components of this in, in feet were larger than the components should be if I go to meters, right? Obviously, the basis vectors are larger, so the components of this vector, which doesn't change, this arrow doesn't change, has to shrink. And that's why next point is that when you expand or contract the coordinate system, the, the, when you expand or contract the, the size of the basis vectors, then the magnitude and the components go in the opposite direction. They shrink. And that's different than rotating. In rotating, it, the components change indeed, but the magnitude stays exactly the same. So rotating doesn't change the magnitude, but the magnitude does change if you change the size of these basis vectors and nothing else. So the property of the arrow is that the magnitude of the arrow will reduce as the coordinate system expands. Now that should be a surprise to us because we know that a vector, right, from this vector space, we always expressed as a mu e mu. And we know that if this changes in a co this changes by definition in a covariant way, and this changes, therefore, in a contravariant way, and the result is that the vector is identity of the vector is the same. But if you expand this, if you make this larger, this is going to have to get smaller. So an arrow in Weinreich's world is what we are calling. Uh, we are calling it a vector, right? And that's how, in our lessons, we call it a vector. In the world of classical general relativity or the classical study of tensors, this is called a contravariant vector. Right? And that comes from the world where the vector we think of as just a mu, right, without the components. In our world, we think of it as a mu e mu with the components, where we think of the components generally as some kind of map. At this point, we're thinking of the components of vectors as maps from dual vectors to the real numbers, just as we'll be doing this in a moment for dual vectors. Um, that, and the basis vectors of dual vectors are maps from the vectors to the real numbers, right? That's our method. We keep the basis vector. And I make a big deal about that. I'm sure that anybody who's really, really studied general relativity for a long time is probably rolling their eyes saying, okay, okay, we, we get your point, right? You know, keep the basis vectors, and that helps you understand what this is all about. But the truth is, is even I, when we do our general relativity lectures, will go back to this form now that we fully understand it, right? Um, either way, uh, See, we wouldn't necessarily use the word contravariant so much. We just call it a vector, and then a dual vector. And we know that the components go in the opposite fashion as the, uh, transform in the opposite fashion as the basis vectors, because they have to, there has to be a unit in there, right? There has to be, um, you, you have to squeeze in the identity matrix, so the transformation matrix and its inverse, uh, T inverse T gets squeezed inside there when you do a transformation. That's obvious to us. In this world, you don't see that. You just see the, in this case, the inverse transformation matrix because you don't see the basis vectors. And that, that was basically, that's 90% of the damn point I'm trying to make for all these lectures anyway. Anyhow, um, but I digress. The point is, is that 
Weinreich adds a totally different concept here. He calls this, uh, he didn't, doesn't add a new concept, he adds a new name. He calls this thing an arrow, and this is how he writes down an arrow. So an arrow is a contravariant vector, and an arrow is basically what we always use um, in classical physics, in our standard classical physics. Everything we have out there looks like an arrow. The problem is, is many of the things in classical physics that we use an arrow to describe don't behave this way. They don't behave the way an arrow should behave. An arrow's behavior is still defined by the fact that its magnitude shrinks if the coordinate system expands. It's contravariant, right? The, the coordinate system, meaning the basis vectors, as they expand, the, coordinates, the, the magnitude of this thing shrinks, or the components change, and they shrink if all you're doing is an expansive. There's a lot of things that go the other way, that as the coordinate system expands, they actually expand also. And uh, I'll do a quick example. So, actually, in, in the split second between what I just said, I'll do a quick example, and now I've changed my mind, and instead I'm going to go right into Weinrich's definition of a stack, and then I'll do a quick example. So, in opposition to the arrow, we have this notion of a stack. And a stack is going to also be a member of a vector space. Now, there's no way I can do this without, um, what's the word, uh, when you um, sort of hint at to what's coming in the future. Um, uh, well, I'll give it away. The stack is a member of the dual space. Therefore, it also has three dimensions. It's real, and it has its own basis, E1, E2, and E3, and foreshadowing, right? We're foreshadowing that this stack is going to be a dual vector. And um, oh, what's the other thing it has to have? Oh, it's, it's got its own addition property, right? Yeah, by the way, you know, obviously there's no problem adding arrows together using the standard vector addition procedure for arrows. Now a stack, we're going to also create a visualization for the stack. And this is the first place where visualization actually matters. So we jump into the vector space, and I'm going to... Um, I'm going to write down the visualization for this unit vector stack. So a stack is a vector because it's a member of a vector space, right? However, it's not a member of this vector space, so a stack is not an arrow. It's a different idea. So I, when I say a stack is a vector, I'm only talking about it, it has the properties of a vector because it lives in a vector space. That doesn't mean it and an arrow are in any way the same. They're different vector spaces, right? It's the dual space. So actually, maybe I should, in some sense, I should say, well, a stack is a vector because it's a member of a vector space, but it's also a covector because obviously I've hinted that the stack is the co the dual, a member of the dual space of the arrow. So I could call a stack a covector or a vector. Uh, depending on how abstractly I'm speaking. In the ultimate abstract form, it is a vector because it's a member of a vector space, but it's also a covector because the particular vector space we're talking about is the dual space to the guy that we're calling an arrow. Okay, all right. Um, maybe I spend too much time clearing that up. Uh, I just always feel like it never hurts to go through it again. But anyway, we're trying to now create a visualization of a stack as Weinreich likes to do it. And this is also the way Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler like to do it. So I'm going to say that this, I'm going to draw this stack of planes. And there's going to be one plane for every unit of distance. And it goes on forever, right? You know, you can't draw them too tall, right? You can't draw them too tall. So I'll just, and they all, they're, in, they're, they're infinite planes, right? It's an infinite plane. Uh, that's a really bad infinite plane. And it goes on forever, and that's my stack E1, and it goes in this direction. So I give it a little arrowhead. So it actually has this, it still has this little feature of an arrow, right? Because it's got a direction. And <clears throat> this stack 
it's characterized entirely by its density. Right? The arrow is characterized entirely by its length, right? Its length. That, that's the key uh, uh, idea of the arrow. It's, well, when I say entirely, it's its length and its direction, right? It's, its components and its direction. But its length is really what, uh, what, uh, what's changing when we change the coordinate system. This stack, it's the density of planes that are changing. And in this basis, this E1... Um, E1, uh, whoops, I'm going to call it E1, has, is, this, is going to be the uni unit density. Unit density. Now, if the, uh, the units over here in the base space, if these units were, say, centimeters, right, if these unit vectors, E1, E2, and E3, if they were centimeters, then this will be one line per centimeter, right? That's the way the dual's going to work. One line per centimeter. So that would be um, your basis stack. Now notice we're drawing this in the vector space, right? This is, I'm representing the, I'm trying to create a visualization of the basis stack inside the vector space. So this is just a single vector space, right? And, um, and likewise, this is inside the vector space. Don't make the mistake of putting this inside real space. Because remember how we're going we're gonna to do this ultimately. Right? Ultimately, real space you know, has some coordinate system, right? And then there's a point here. Well, that point contains its own vector space V, which we call the tangent space. So when I write an arrow, I'm drawing the arrow in the tangent space. I'm not drawing the arrow in real space. Now, in elementary physics, we have a big tendency to do that. In differential equations, even, when we try to solve, we, we talk about vector fields, and then we solve differential equations that sort of try to merge these vector fields into integral lines. So that's a terrible... Um, the integral lines which are... The vectors are supposed to all be tangent to the... So if I did, if I created this vector field like this, I should be able to come with an integral line for which the, uh, which the vector is a tangent everywhere, right? So we have this tendency to draw these vectors as though they're in the space that we're studying, but it's not. It's in this tangent space. Whoops. So when I, when I draw this, I'm actually drawing something inside the tangent space. I'm, I'm this whole abstraction is happening in the tangent space. Likewise, this. This thing exists in the cotangent space, right? V star. So when I draw these planes, I'm drawing... That's an example. That's my visualization of this infinite stack, which goes on forever but has a direction um, inside that, that's attached to this point. All right. So now, um, that's E1. Well, what's E2? Well, E2 is going to go... Uh, I guess E2 would go... Well, let's, let's orient it this way for now. Again, it has unit density, and it goes like that. Say, positive direction like that. And that's E2, right? Now... I'm drawing E1 on, and E2 on top of each other like this, and that makes sense because they both sort of have this infinite extension. It's, it's an abstract object. It's just a bunch of planes with a certain density, right? But, um, uh, whoops. but the fact that they, the, they overlap is really kind of irrelevant, right? Because I'm talking about two different unit vectors. It just so happens that when we do it here, we don't have to worry about E3 and E2 kind of overlapping. Um, it's just not what arrows do, right? They share a point, though. That's kind of interesting. So there's that question. Is they, they, you know, We have this sort of abstract question of whether they share a point. Ultimately, what matters is that you can write down a term like this algebraically. That's the sort of the abstract way. 
So once you start visualizing, you start asking all kinds of questions like, well, what's this thing all about? What's that point of intersection? And the point of intersection doesn't mean much, right? But because we want to visualize it, we end up with little questions like that. Well, that's equivalent here, but in the stack, there's lots of these intersections. Now, with the stack, there's also the point is, well, what's in between the stacks, right? So if this is, say, we arbitrarily numbered the stacks, and we called this one, say, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, you know, and presumably there's an infinite number in both directions, <clears throat> and they go off in infinite directions in both sides. Um, well, there's fractional stacks, right? So there would, you know, there's this, you know, there's an infinite number of these guys in here, and they're all sort of given a real number between one and two with the exact same density everywhere. So, so uh, and as we'll see later, what's important is how many stacks you cross. So we can cross one stack, two stack, and a half stack, so we can get two and a half stacks of crossing, right? Um, <clears throat> so that would be uh, <clears throat> E1 and E2. Now, because uh, this is three-dimensional, these things have to actually be understood as planes, right? So let's see if I can pull this off artistically. Um, <laughs> so here is our here is our E1 stack. And this is beautifully drawn in Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, by the way. That would be the E1 stack with its little arrowhead going this way. And then the E2 stack would look like this, right, going that way, <clears throat> where I call this, uh, say, hmm, I guess I need one more, like that, and then I don't know, how do I get the arrowhead to make it look like it's going that way? I'll just throw an arrow on it. And then there's the E3 stack, of course, which would go this way. So the stack is a bunch of planes. Now, two, if I was dealing with two dimensions, the stack would be lines, right? So then the E3 stack somehow goes like that, right? Where its arrowhead goes in this direction, say. It doesn't matter which way I put the arrowheads, by the way, um, when I'm defining these things. So anyway, so there's, uh, that's E3, E2, and E1. Those are the three stacks. Now, the, a, a, full, a stack in full generality, of course, is going to be A mu E mu. So you have to be able to add stacks, right? I said stacks were a member of, a, of the dual space, so they have an addition property. So we certainly know, and I'm not going to explain how to add vectors or arrows, as I should be calling them, but adding stacks, if I looked at it from edge on and... Uh, Say I added, say I wanted to create the stack E1 plus E2, right? Where I guess A1 equals 1 and A2 equals 1. Well, here's the stack. Yeah, I, better, I better draw it larger. Here's the stack E1 looked on from the edge. And here's the stack E2. Wait a minute, all right, all right, hold on. I've now gone to, vert E3 is vertical, E1 is sort of X, E2 is Y, so let me make this, let me make this E1 plus E3 so I can be consistent with this picture, right? So this is E1 plus E3. So now I'm drawing the E3 stacks, which I guess I'll do in blue. Like that. Now, the E3 stacks are headed in this direction, the E1 stacks are headed in this direction. So now the addition of those two, E1 plus E3, is not a difficult construction. You just sort of go through the diagonals here. Remember, this is all geometrical, so I don't need to write down equations or anything. I'm not, like I said, so this is E1 plus E3, right? That's what those green lines are. And which direction does it go? Well, the arrow of this will have to point um, in between the other two arrows, like that, right? So um, that's how I choose which lines to do, right? I could have chosen, for example, these lines, right? 
and I would have had the black had the had I been using minus e1. So that would be so these dotted lines, I guess, would be e3 minus e1, right? Anyway, you can add them, and you can add them in three dimensions and two dimensions, right? So you can end up adding them together. But in the end, when you add them, you still get stacks. Don't make the mistake of looking at this and say, well, you've, whoops, you've got this sort of honeycomb structure or this egg crate structure, which we will eventually get, but not through addition. Addition gives us more, another stack gives us, and you can always create any stack by adding these three basis stacks together. All right, so now we have created the, um, the stack and the arrow. So we can go back to this picture here, and we can realize that every point in space has what I will call now the dual space, um, the dual space of stacks, and the dual space of arrows. And, <clears throat> and now um, this happens, at, this exists at every point, right? Every point has its own arrow space and its own stack space. And that's, by now you should understand, that's just another way of saying every point has its own tangent space and its own cotangent space. All right, so now let's get to that example. I guess the, the classic example of this parallel plate capacitor, I think, is the favorite example of this. This is two parallel plates, and we're going to have a voltage here, and there's going to be a displacement here. Now, the displacement is a vector, right? So this is the risky stuff of elementary physics, right? I write this displacement vector d here, and it looks like we're in actual space, right? Because this is a capacitor, right? It exists in space, right? There's a little xyz coordinate here, x, I guess, yz coordinate system here, and this parallel plate capacitor lives in there. And I wrote this vector d, or this arrow d, and it looks like it lives in this space, but it doesn't, right? This displacement is just an abstract displacement vector that is representing the distance between point A and point B, but it has to live in some tangent space somewhere. And um, presumably it lives in the tangent space located at A, right? It's, it, it doesn't have any true extension in space. It only represents an extension in space. So um, if we align this, say, straight up with the z-axis like this, you know, we would say D... Uh, uh, is the length of this displacement in the z direction. Now the thing is we have a certain voltage. Uh, God, v is my vector space, so I'll have to write, I'll just write out the word, voltage, right? So there's a certain voltage uh, there, and I guess, let's see, this has to be the positive charge here, and this has to be the negative charge of the plate. I'm, it's been a while since I've done this, but I seem to remember the electric field goes this direction, right? And that's the electric field E. And look what I've done. I've put an arrow for the electric field E because we all knew that the electric field is a vector, right? Electric field vector. We've always used it that way. We've all, it shows up in Maxwell's equations, for God's sakes, right? Uh, so it's, it's, those are vector equations. It's got to be a vector. Um, well, of course, it is a vector, in the, certainly in the most abstract sense. Uh, whatever we use to represent the electric field will be a vector in the sense that it will live in a vector space. But it's not an arrow, right? That's the point we're about to make. It's not an arrow. It is actually something else. And the reason is because if we change D, say D is measured in centimeters, right? Let's do that thing we just did before. If we measure D in centimeters, a good scientific measurement unit, but say we changed it to meters. Well, the electric field would go from, well, from voltage over centimeters, over some amount of centimeters, over D centimeters, to voltage over D in meters. The problem is, is that 
the actual distance between the plates isn't changing. So d, the number d, is large here and it's small here. Say, let's be specific, say d was one centimeter. Well here, the electric field is voltage over one centimeter. But here the electric field is voltage over 0 0.01 meters. So the electric field actually grows. So we did the exact same thing we did over here, right? We took we took the uh, the vectors of the underlying space. So, okay, so I guess that's another important point. So here the it's the dimension of space that's changing, right? And this displacement vector is um, is going to adjust, is going to expand or contract. So here we expand or contract the coordinate system, and E actually grows with expansion, right? So E does not, as an arrow, if we uh, E, if we um, try to think of E as an arrow, E should shrink with the expansion, but it actually expands with the expansion. So um, that expansion is makes it clear that E is not an arrow, right? Because it behaves differently under a coordinate system transformation. Now it behaves exactly the same way as an arrow would if you did rotations, right? Rotations are fine. You can rotate this all day and you'd never notice the difference. But if you expand or contract, which is sort of this unit change, for example, you do in fact change the value of the magnitude of E. And that change um, goes with the expansion or contraction. So because of that, E is a different object. And this is a huge thing in physics, right? Whenever something, you, we almost, it's almost like a core principle of physics now. I, I think it is a core principle of physics, why not? Things that transform or change differently between, if you ch change the coordinate system, if you change or you transform uh, coordinates, expand, contract, rotate, stretch, bend, whatever you do, things that behave differently under those kinds of transformations are in fact different things, right? It's, they can't, you can't be the same type of thing and then, but transform in a different way. And in fact, that is almost like the true test of whether things are the same or different. So E is clearly not an arrow, right? Displacement, however, is an arrow, right? Because if I go from one centimeter to meters, displacement shrinks, right? It goes from one to 0 0.01. So displacement is an arrow, but the electric field is the opposite of an arrow. And in fact, it is a stack. And you can imagine going back to the stack picture, if I change the units to meters, my density is going to change. There's going to be a lot more lines per meter than there are per centimeter. Right? If there's one line per centimeter, because I've, I've got my E, my basis vector is set to unit density in centimeters, if I suddenly change E to uh, a scale of meters, right? If I change E to a scale of meters, then, um, well, if I change the uh, dimensions of E1 to a scale of meters, right? Because it's the underlying basis vector that's changing to meters. If I change this to a distance scale of meters, this density is now going to be 100 lines per meter, right? So E1 is going to go up. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the, wait, 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 wait. See, this is easy to confuse yourself. The, the density is going to go up, and that is the component of E1. So uh, E1 is now being... Uh, the, the density goes from uh, one line per centimeter to 100 lines per meter, right? And that's the component of, of the stack. So as the underlying uh, basis vector is stretched, the component of the stack stretches with it because it is covariant, right? Right, because it's a mu e mu. So this thing varies with 
the underlying basis vector. And the underlying basis vector is what's being stretched to meters. The, this unit density is actually contravariant. It's shrinking. It's shrinking in order to accommodate all this. So the electric field is actually to be thought of as a stack. Okay, so that's cool. So in our in our language now, the electric field is um, is uh, behaves more as a dual vector, but it behaves as a stack. Okay, um, now uh, what's the next thing? So the difficulty with this, and the reason it's not taught that way, is let's go back to to this picture here. What are we going to do? Well, we don't like this picture anymore because we're drawing like an arrow. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to squeeze in a little bunch of stacks here like this just to represent E and you, you could right um, the problem is is that again this thing doesn't live in this space so but neither does this really right that's the electric field vector there's an electric field at every point in space-time right so you would have to every point has a tangent space and each of those tangent spaces contain an electric field vector right every point, but we draw it with one big one here just to catch it all. So I would have to do the same thing here. I would have to say, okay, there's a little cotangent space, and that's where this this stack lives. It lives in a little cotangent space at every point in space-time. Little cotangent space. And so it's kind of hard to draw it that way, but that is an accurate idea of what we would, what uh, of, of how we would um, depict it, right? We don't worry, say, about the thickness of this arrow so much, right? You know, that doesn't ever worry us. So the fact that these little lines don't extend to infinity in all directions, that shouldn't worry us too much. It does inside the cotangent space, right? That's that's this picture, well, I guess this picture here, right? So this is one of the reasons why this visualization doesn't actually simplify things on the front end, right? If you tried to teach this in the beginning I don't think it would help. Um, also, think of it this way too. If you have a stack, right? Here's our stack, right, with an arrow. Well, why don't I just do this? Why don't I just say if this is if the density is what's important here, right? Maybe I'll write a very dense stack, right? So, if the density is what's important here, why don't I just take an arrow, give it a magnitude equal to the density, right? where that would be a very dense stack, and this would be a very sparse stack. So this, this arrow might represent this stack, whereas this arrow might represent this stack, and the magnitude is equal to the density of the stack, right? Um, and that's, in fact, exactly what we do, right? That's what this picture really is. Um, and so uh, the problem is, is, well, so is that a problem? Why don't we just do it that way? And the answer is, is well, we, we want a bit of a deeper understanding of physics in terms of geometry, and that simply doesn't work. This arrow will transform under changes of the coordinate system differently than this arrow. And so to use an arrow for both of them just isn't right. This is the correct picture for both of those situations, for those two different situations. And just because our little brain would rather draw an arrow than have this sort of infinite stack. Uh, well, that's, that's our little brain's problem. It's not reality's problem. That's the way we really want it to be. So, um, so there's an example of a physical property that deals with, deals with the stack. And you can find anything that's expressible as a uh, covariant or a contravariant vector is either a stack or is a... Uh, arrow. And clearly, stacks and arrows can be related if you have a metric, right? Because we now know that if I do g, and it's waiting for two vectors, if I put in one vector, right, then this guy here is now waiting for another vector to churn out a real number. Therefore, this thing is a member of the dual space. Well, the way we think of it is I take an arrow, stick it into this metric tensor machine, and I get out a stack. So stacks and arrows can be related. And in fact, they frequently are related, but they're not the same. All right, so uh, now about dual space mappings. So when we talk about dual space mappings now, um, we're 
trying to recapture in purely visualization language this operation where we put a dual vector here and a vector here and we get out a real number. So we go to the point in space, <clears throat> call it A, and we jump into the tangent space and we have a vector. That's the, the tangent space, V. And we jump into the cotangent space and we have a stack. Now we know that we know from our understanding of how these things work, these guys are supposed to be maps that take these guys and give you real numbers, right? If this is the dual space of this, then, then um, uh, a stack apply a given stack applied to a given arrow, right? So these are arrows. By the way, Weinreich likes to call these arrows and stacks. They'll call with a little line underneath, right? So Weinreich wants to be able to take a stack, apply it to an arrow, and get a real number. And he's going to create an operation to do that, which he calls the dot product. So he wants to be able to write a dot b, which is um, a vector dotted with a stack. But it's commutative, so we sh this should equal b dot a also. Um, b dot a, like that. So he calls this the dot product. A little risky notationally, because... When we use, usually use the dot product, we usually say two vectors are dotted together, right? And that gives us a real number. But of course, that is um, an inner product, right? Now, what we're about to do is the dual space mapping. The dual space mapping, which does not require an inner product. Right? The dual space mapping just is exploiting the fact that each of these whoops, each of these is by definition a map that takes this to the real numbers. So the problem is, is dots are often used for inner products. And here we're using a dot to represent the dual space mapping between a covector and a vector. And in Weinreich's language, he doesn't use the word covector and vector. He just says a stack dotted with an arrow. So if you do go read Weinreich, understand that he's using dot products in a very specific way, and it's fine. Mathematicians will define things on the fly, and he's defining this as a dot product. And he creates several different kinds of dot products, which will cover each one eventually. But um, this dot product here that he's talking about is actually our dual space mapping. And his visualization of this is really simple. You actually are basically going to squeeze both of these things into the same uh, place and the same vector, uh, the same picture, because it's visualization. So here is some, here is some stack, and I'll just draw a few vectors. Here's a vector, and uh, here's a vector, say, right? And here's I could even do a vector like that, right? And um, the, all three of these circumstances uh, are, uh, reflect a different form of dual space mapping. This, this the, the, the real number that you get from the dual space map is the number of stack planes that are crossed by an arrow, right? So if the arrow crosses, in this case, one, two, three, four, and a half, this guy, if I call that arrow A, and this is stack B, then A dotted into B is 4.5. In this case, if I call this uh, arrow C, this would be 1, 2. Wow, that's 2. So C dot stack B was 2.0. Um, and then in this case, there's no planes crossed, no planes at all. So I'll call that D. So D dot B equals zero. In this case, we say that the arrow is contained in 
the stack. But here's the deal. When, we, when I say the arrow is contained in the stack, this entire stack is also contained in the arrow. Now, it doesn't look like that. So the visualization of mutual containment kind of breaks down, right? But we, the language is still exactly parallel. The stack is contained in the arrow, and the arrow is contained in the stack. However, visually, only the arrow is actually contained in the stack. Okay, so that's another case. And then, of course, there's always these fractional cases, right? You can imagine a little arrow, or a little arrow like that, or a little arrow like that. This would be something like 2.5, 0.5, maybe 3 quarters, something like that. So the point is, is that that is now how dual space mapping is, is handled. And you can actually work this out very specifically, and you'll always come into contact with our standard definition of, of um, B mu E mu A nu E nu equals essentially A mu B mu, right? That's the ultimately where you're going to end up. And this is the visualization of stacks. Now, in, uh, I, I put the origin of these vectors in different places just so you could, um, uh, just so we could sort of see several different examples. Uh, Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler has some excellent pictures of this, uh, much better than Weinreich's. Uh, the illustrations in MTW are much better than Weinreich's, but they're both pretty good, actually. And they're different. They don't, they don't say the same things. They have different visualization plans. Uh, we're going to go through the differences as these lectures progress, but they're different visualization plans. Um, they're, very, they're very similar, but critically different in certain ways. Um, but remember, uh, the, as I was about to say, this point A is a point in space that has its tangent space and its cotangent space. This applies to tangent and cotangent vectors. Um, uh, regular vectors, which are called arrows, and cotangent vectors, which are now called stacks. Um, and uh, uh, so where these tails, this is totally abstract, where these tails are is irrelevant. Uh, you just have to know that they both have to come from the mutual tangent space, cotangent space. You can't go to the tangent space and cotangent space of some other place and then take these dual vectors and then operate on those vectors, right? That's not right, because these guys are maps from this space to the real numbers, not from that space to the real numbers. I think I've got, if that's one not totally dead horse by now. <laughs> um, okay, anyway, so that covers the subject of arrows and stacks. So we've now done this. We've got that we're calling arrows, this we're calling stacks. These are one vectors. These are one forms. All right. So we now have, uh, we're doing three-dimensional space, right? So foreshadowing, we've done those. Now we have this space to worry about. We have this space to worry about. And because those are two forms, and these are, oops, I'm sorry, these are two forms, these are two vectors. So then we, the last thing we have is and three vectors and three forms, right? And then we have scalars, right? So that's zero forms. So we have so we now learned how to visualize these guys. All of these guys have yet to be handled. We have to visualize those. And notice that's it because we're in three dimensions, so all we can have is a three form which is going to be a one-dimensional vector space, and this is a three-vector, which is also going to be a one-dimensional vector space. This is going to be a one-dimensional vector space. So that takes care of our 1D vector spaces. This, these here, take care of our 3D vector spaces, and it turns out these are also 3D, right? That's one of the fun things about three dimensions, is that the one forms and the two forms both have the same number of dimensions, which is why it's very easy to conflate the two, which is um, 
what also happens, which we'll see. Uh, it's easy to conflate the cross product with an actual vector, for example. But we'll get to that next. So the rest of our lectures is now about visualizing these guys and visualizing these guys and then ultimately extending it to n dimensions. Okay, see you later.